church. Come on, church. Come on, church. You got something to worship about. You got something to be thankful for. You got something to praise Jesus about. Come on, church. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Take your seats. That was awesome. Jesus likes that too, man. Living as a last day Christian. This is part three of our series that we're in. And uh, I started setting out my chapter. And I, I have the honor and privilege of, of today of teaching you Second Peter chapter three. And this is Peter's final chapter in his final book. And I started reading through the chapter, and this is kind of what my thoughts. This is a strange final chapter. That's what I was thinking. I thought, man, this is some odd things that Peter is telling the church at the time and that we're reading today. But then I started, at, I read it at first, and I thought, this is, I don't know what this is. This is interesting. But then as I studied it out, it began to make sense. I think if I could sum up 2 Peter chapter 3 for us today, it would be this. Be aware. Be aware. And what we're going to learn today is, I think, important things I keep calling them things. I don't know what else to call them. Important lessons, important aspects, important events that are happening or will happen and that are happening in the last days that Peter prophetically speaks to us today. I think it's going to cause you to wake up, cause you to look up, cause you to be aware. A Christian that is Waiting for Jesus' return is a better Christian. A Christian that is excited for Jesus' return is a better Christian. A Christian that is aware and looking constantly for Jesus' return is a better Christian. So we're going to learn today about how prophetic Peter was to us as he describes the actual world that we are living in today. Now, this is Peter's final chapter. How many people th think that the, your final words are important words? They're, they're, they're weightier words. Somebody's last words are important words. And these are Peter's final words. And he, I believe that these are heavy words, that, that these are purposeful words for us today. We're actually going to dive through the entire chapter. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get through the entire chapter, but I've studied out the entire chapter. I'm going to take my time as we go. Maybe part two, part three slash two, maybe is next week. Living as last day Christian, part three, one, today. Part three, two, next week, maybe. We'll see, it. we'll see how it goes. But let me start off just by reading the first two verses. This is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. So he's first and foremost saying, I'm going to take, I'm going to remind you. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I constantly need reminders. My wife has to plan my day, remind me of my schedule, moments before my appointment, a text to say, are you there? And I need constant reminders. And how much more now, even too, 
Just as being a Christian, we forget the, some of the important aspects of our relationship with Jesus. That we are forgiven. That we are loved. That his mercies are new every morning. Because we'll wake up some days and we'll just beat ourselves up. Oh, I should have, oh, why did I do that? I can't believe I did that again. I can't believe I responded like that. I can't believe I said that. Oh, I'm such a terrible person. And we'll forget that his mercies are new every morning and we need to stop beating ourselves up and we just need to live in the mercy and grace of our Father. See, we need reminders as Christians. I've made this error by judging those Israelites as they walked through that desert for 40 years. I've made the error in judging them. I've judged Jesus' disciples as they were so dull and slow to understand what Jesus was saying. I mean, Jesus would say that he was going to go do something, and then he would do it, and the disciples would be confused. And he would be like, I just told you I was going to do that. And they were like, we didn't understand. What's not to understand? He just said it out loud. And I judged them. But the truth and the reality of the Israelites who wandered through the desert for 40 years, making golden calves and worshiping them, forgetting that God parted the Red Sea so that they could walk through and escape the Egyptians, forgetting that manna fell from he was coming from heaven, forgetting that they were fed with quail, forgetting that their clothes never ran out, never got holes. They had the same pair of clothes and shoes for 40 years. They forgot that Moses struck the rock and water flowed out of it. They forgot again that Moses struck the rock again and water flowed out of it. They forget and forget and forget get and forget and I'm thinking to myself what's wrong with them but I am just like them and so are you that God has done something before for me and I get nervous about it again that will he do it again and I need reminders and so do you I want you to remember this simple acronym go ahead put it up there go ahead put it up there there it is I needed a reminder. <laughs> look, at this simple rem look at this simple acronym that I want you to remember. You ready? If he did it before, he can do it again. If he did it before, he can do it again. What a simple acronym for us to remember today. I presented this acronym to our young adult leaders a few months ago, and we laughed and laughed and laughed. But it's the truth. I-H-D-I-B-H-C-D-I-A. You can't forget it. If he did it before, he can do it again. Do you believe it? And I'm, I'm just reminding you today, folks, that if Jesus did it before in your life, that he can do it again. That, that you, you, Jesus provided, Jesus answered a prayer, Jesus healed your body, Jesus saved your children. If he did it before, he can do it again. Peter wants to remind them. We need reminders. God is good, folks. God is faithful. He makes promises and he keeps them. Here's another reminder. Jesus is coming again. Peter has the authority to write these things. There was some sense that as, he as these letters were circulating the church at the time, there was a, 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 there was a, a sense, there was a, a realization that these letters, that these words, that these early church pastors and apostles these things that these men were writing was inspired from heaven and it was written words of God. There was a sense, because he says it in verse 2. I want you to remember what the holy prophets said long ago and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. He's trying to tell them, listen, the holy scriptures 
those first five books of the Bible, those minor prophets, those major prophets, those things, and what we're writing to you today from your apostles, I want to remind you of these amazing things that are being written today. Let's continue on verses 3 through 4. Like I said, we're in 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From the four the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. That's what they'll say. They'll say, they'll say, what happened to Jesus? He's gone. Where is he at? He's not here. Everything is the same as it's been forever. Here, Jesus isn't coming. They'll mock. They'll scoff. And I want to encourage even the young people in the room. Scoffers are here. Mockers are here. Don't let a scoffer and a mocker sow seeds of doubt. Don't let a a, a scoffer and a mocker cause you to second guess these truths in the word of God. Pastor Tim said last week, Christians will always be in the minority. This will never be a nation dominated with Christians. We need to come to grips with that. So what do we do when we come up against a scoffer and a mocker? Go ahead, let them talk. Because you know that Jesus is coming again. We will be taken up. There will be vindication. You will have the final triumphant victory. Victory is ours because of Christ Jesus. And if you believe that, then the victory is yours too. Amen. And scoffers are here and mockers are here and doubters are here. And some of them are smart. And some of them are mean and cruel. And some are wise. But they're just telling lies. They're just trying to justify a lifestyle. They're trying to justify their depraved minds. They're trying to justify their evil hearts. And they want to pull you down with them. Young people, don't go down with them. I, I said this, that, that Christians are going to be in the minority. That America is, I don't, America will never be a nation ruled by God ever again. I want you to wrap your mind around that. But what do you do? You say this verse that you know by heart, Joshua 24, verse 25. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Amen, church? You go ahead, read every story of the Old Testament. Read every story of the New Testament. Were Christians ever in the majority? Were Christians ever truly in power? Were Christians ever really in control of anything? Nope, never. But just like Joshua, go ahead, world, choose today whom you will serve. But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That's what you need to do. Don't let a mocker destroy your faith. Don't let a scoffer make you doubt. Mankind rebels against the creator because the creator calls them to be holy and loving. The message of scoffers is, where is Jesus? That cannot be the message of Christians. Don't doubt. Don't worry. Don't wonder. Don't have a second guess about, is he, is he coming again? What's happening here? If a fellow Christian is starting to doubt the return of Jesus, questioning his return, let me take a moment and remind you right now that Jesus is coming again, and we will all be completely vindicated, saved, saved. Amen, church? Verse 5. Let's do 5 through 7. 
They deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used that same water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. Peter is saying that people willfully, deliberately forget that God made everything. You know, science proves the Bible. Science points to a young earth. Science points to a flood, which is exactly what Peter is trying to say here. It's a young earth, and there was a flood. People doubted it 2,000 years ago. They mocked it. They scoffed at it. They deliberately tried to forget it. It happened, and it happened, and it's still the same thing today. Do you know that all throughout civiliza- all civilizations, all civilizations have a flood story? As they dig up civilizations and unearth all that, you know, all that, uh, what do they call it, you know, digging in the ground? Archaeologists, thank you, I kept thinking architect or, or something like that, archaeologists. When archaeologists dig up the ground and they uncover civilizations and they find the, the, the tablets of stone with stories written on them, did you know that all of them have a flood story? It's just becoming silly that they just don't acknowledge it. And this is what Peter is saying. This is just silly that they deny it. It's just getting silly, folks. Just acknowledge it. Just admit there was a flood. Just admit that God created everything. They still haven't found the missing link that proves evolution. Did you know that the amount of dust found on the earth and the amount of dust found on the moon proves that the world is around 10,000 years old? Science points to it. As NASA planned the moon landing, the thought was the earth was millions of years old. So they designed the lunar module with a short ladder, thinking that the lunar module would sink into about two feet of dust. But when the lunar, but when the lunar module hit the surface of the moon, there was about an inch of dust. Proving that the moon had only been there for thousands of years and not millions. Neil Armstrong says this, and I quote, he's actually standing on the ladder of the lunar module, hasn't touched the surface of the moon yet, and this is what he's, quotes, saying. Okay, standing on the final step of the ladder, and it's a pretty good step, (laughs) but it's adequate to get back up And it's a pretty good jump. They created a short ladder about this high up. He ended up being about this high up off the surface of the moon, the final step. And he was concerned as he was coming down the ladder. And he noticed, okay, all of our math was incorrect. He doesn't want to say too much. But it's clear to see they were completely wrong about how much dust was on the moon. He also says... The land, the land footbeds are only depressed into the surface one or two inches. It appears to be fine grain ore powder, dust. You know, science just put out a report. This actually just was reported. They said it appears that every human being came from one woman. <laughs> they just figured out what we all have known Forever, but they still won't give any credit to the Bible or God or the idea that, yes, Adam and Eve were the first humans. They are deliberate in their report of forgetfulness. And Peter is saying that God brought a flood and judgment before, and he's going to do it again, but this time with fire. Peter is trying to tell the church God did it before. Folks, rest assured, it's coming again. 
And, and when you understand and you get, begin to see what, if the acronym that I told you, it's easy to remember. And I, I'm just going to go up my notes just for my own sake. But it's not it's an easy acronym to remember. I-H-D-I-B-H-C-D-I-A. That if he did it before, he can do it again. And he's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. Now, if, if you believe in Jesus, this stuff excites you. If you don't believe in Jesus, this stuff will upset you. Let's continue on in verses. Let's do verses 8 through 10. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. He's not giving, let me stop there for a second. He's not d- giving you the exact mathematical equations of what heaven is like, time-wise. Some people like to take this idea that a thousand years is a day, and it, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus ascended, so it's been two days in heaven. That's not what Peter is doing here. He's not giving you a formula to figure out time. He's just saying to us today that God doesn't live in time. He's, he's, he's before time, in time, in future time. The best way to explain heaven and the, the, the clock of heaven is God's glory rolls through the ages. That's just the best way to think about it. Verse 9. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve Judgment. Any perceived delay of Jesus' return is proof of God's long suffering. Long suffering. But here's the here's the thing is once you're right with God, you want him to return today. Once you realize you are not created for this world, and this world has nothing for you, you want to go to heaven. You want Je- Once you become a Christian, you are ready for Jesus to return. But you must have more of a God mindset to understand that God is being patient and long-suffering because he desires, he wants, he wills that none would perish. None. And we must have that same heart. That's why we evangelize. That's why, we, that's why we go on missions. That's why we do local outreaches. That's why we invite people to church. That's why we pray for our friends and family members. Amen, church? God is giving time and allowing more people to fill up heaven. You know, Peter's saying here that one of God's wills is that none would perish. But I want to let you know about this. Simply because God wills it doesn't mean it happens. Just because God wants us with him doesn't mean that everyone will be with him. His love for us is proven in our ability to choose him or not. Hmm. You know, God is more concerned with loving and love than forcing humanity to worship him. If somebody forces you to love them, that's not love. If the president of the United States put up a golden statue of himself and said, everybody bow or you die, is that love? No. You see, and some people get frustrated with God because because he's not, he he doesn't control everybody to love him, to serve him, to, to love people, to be holy. He never forces anybody. He loves us unconditionally, and his desire is that we would return that to him. We would honor him. We would be thankful for him. 
we would just be say, we would look around and say, well, my gosh, God, you made everything so beautiful. You, and you did this for me? It's just a love gift. Look at the sunset. Did anybody see the sunset last night? That was a pretty sunset. That was a love gift from God to you. Just acknowledge it. Just say, oh, God, look what you did for me today. Thank you. You didn't need to do any of that. And God is more concerned with love than forcing humanity to worship him. In John chapter 21, the disciples, and especially Peter, denied Jesus, ran away, left. The next day, they leave everything. They're scattered. They're gone. And a few days later, they're out fishing. Peter, the leader of the group, he's messed up the most. He denied Jesus three times in that rooster crows, and he made eye contact with Jesus. He ran away weeping bitterly. He's a broken human being. They're out fishing on the water in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has got a charcoal fire going on the beach, cooking some fish. He's risen from the dead. He's back. John, the disciple, recognizes that's Jesus. Peter jumps in the water, swims to shore, leaves the other ten, gathering up the nets, the Bible says, because they got fish in them, and they're, then they got to row back to shore. But Peter quickly gets to shore and meets Jesus. And what does Jesus do for Peter? That's the most important thing Peter must know. Jesus says, do you love me? He didn't lecture Peter on his mistakes. He didn't lecture Peter on his choices. He didn't bring up any of Peter's past words. He cursed. He denied him. He lied. He didn't bring any of that up. What does Jesus say to Peter? He says, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, you know I love you. Okay, then, get to work. The question to all of us today is, Jesus is asking, do you love me? You're so caught up in all your mistakes. You're so caught up in coming up short. You're so caught up in, 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 in all these things. But the really, the true heart of the Father is, do you love me? And if you can say yes, then Jesus says, all right, let's get to work. God, Peter's saying here, God punishing the people of earth is justified because they willfully rebelled against a creator who gave them free choice, which was an act of love from God, and they chose to hate God instead of love him. Peter says the first time God punished the earth, he did it with water, but the second time he's going to do it with fire. Let's go on to verses 11 through 13. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and, what, what holy and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. And that day he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth as he promised, a world filled with with God's righteousness. Knowing that the world is going to be burned up, what are your top priorities? Ever thought about that? I mean, truly, ever pondered that before? That everything you worked so hard to create and build and buy and, and, and save will be a burned up in the fire. And if that's the case, what are your top priorities? In my mind, I logically think about this. My top priorities would be to invest in something that's going to withstand the fire, right? What will live beyond the fire? And the Bible does not tell us what they are. There's two things that we should invest in that will live and outlast the fire. Number one is people. People will live beyond the fire. People will live for eternity. Some in the fire and some in heaven on the new earth. But the second thing that will be forever and eternal is the word of God. Invest in people 
and the word of God. Study the word. Memorize the word. Read the word. Enjoy the word. Know the word. Get to know the love letter that's probably sitting on your lap right now. Get to know it. Read it. Learn it. Study it. Become involved with it. People. You know, and Peter says that we can hurry along the day of Jesus' return. How many people want to hurry it along? How many people want it to become sooner than later? You want to? <laughs> Peter is saying we can hurry it along. He actually says that in verse 12. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. He's telling the people that we can hurry it along. How do we do that? Holy conduct, prayer, and evangelism. That's how we hurry it along. If I hired you for a job and I told you, you can get this job done in either two hours or 24 hours, and no matter what, I'm going to pay you the same, would you want to get it done in two hours or 24 hours? You'd want to get it done in two hours. That's essentially what Peter is saying here. Listen, we could get this thing done in two hours or we could get this thing done in 24 hours. We can actually hurry this thing along. Evangelism is probably the best way to just simply hurry along the coming of the Lord. Hurrying it along. I think that's pretty cool. This is the proposition presented here to us by Peter. Hey, believers, if you hurry up and evangelize the Gentiles, (laughs) Jesus will come back sooner. I think that's pretty cool. Verse 14. And so, dear friends... While you are waiting for these things to happen, make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom God gave him. Speaking of these things in all of his letters, some of his comments are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters to mean something quite different just as they do with other parts of Scripture. And this will result in their destruction. Peter is saying, people have twisted the Scriptures. People have twisted the letters of Paul. And boy, we see that happening today. People love to twist the Scriptures to justify their lifestyles. It's called called, uh, uh, scriptural gymnastics. They read the scriptures and they twist them and they bend them and they, fl- and they, and they turn them around and they, and they read them backwards and they read them from the middle out and they're trying to figure out a way to get this scripture to justify their sin. It's happening so much. Pastor Aaron and myself love to sit around at lunchtime and laugh at the most recent stupid twisting of scripture to justify a lifestyle. And we, read, and we actually watch these videos of these people twisting scripture to justify the lifestyle, we just laugh and laugh and laugh, and then we start making up our own. And it becomes really easy, really easy to just make up a whole thing about, we can make up our own theology. What was the one we made up at lunch the other day? Oh, my gosh. It's so easy just to make something up. I heard one pastor say, when when Jesus called Lazarus out of the grave, he was calling him out of the closet. And... This is what people are doing now. They're just twisting scripture to justify lifestyles. The Bible does not mean whatever you want it to mean. And the Bible can be figured out and simply figured out. Be aware, people today are twisting scripture. So don't fall for all their silly mind games. Verse 17. I am going to finish today. You already know these things, dear friends. So be on guard. Then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever. Amen. Spend your days growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was looking up about what, what will last forever. And interestingly enough, there was one 
thing in particular listed that science says it, it kind of it does last forever. And they said one of the things that is here on the earth that will that lasts forever is stones and rocks. Stones and rocks. It's one of the very few elements that actually does last forever. Stone monuments built by civilizations thousands of years ago still stand today. I've seen the, the pyramids in Cairo with my very own eyes. I've touched them. I've climbed them. It is big stone, and everything around that area has turned to dust except those stone pyramids. I've been to the pyramids in Mexico City, built by the Mayans. They're made of stone. They still stand, even though everything else around that area has turned to dust. I'm going to just encourage you to invest in a rock. Matthew 16, verse 18 says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. It is very important that Jesus calls Peter a rock, a stone. Because a stone doesn't go away. It doesn't erode. You can light it on fire and it sits there. It takes the heat. You can, it can be rained on, set on fire, uh, you know, stomped on over and over again, walked on. It still stands the test of time. Invest in the church, a rock that will last forever. Amen? Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look. I'm placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. Our God is a rock, a stone. No accident, folks, that Peter is called the rock on which the church will be built. Jesus is called a stone that is firm, a foundational stone, a stone that cannot be moved. He is a rock. He lasts forever. Are you going to invest in eternity with me? I know we all are concerned about today and tomorrow. I know we're trying to make it all happen, make it all happen, build our buildings and do our things, but the honest Reality, it's all going to be burned up. But you invest in a rock. A rock. I got a rock for sale. Actually, it's free. It won't cost you a single thing. Everything else is going up in price. But this rock is free. Jesus Christ, his church, you get to invest in it. You get to put your hope in it. Man, strange enough, isn't it a rock? And, the, and, and in the Old Testament, it prophesies that this stone is going to be a stone that the builders rejected. I wonder why they reject it. It's perfect. It's 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 strong. It's secure. It lasts forever. I wonder why they reject it. Let's not reject it. It's a gift. And all we got to do is take it. That's all we got to do. Oh, church, Jesus, the rock, the rock won't move. His word is strong. I love you, Jesus. My Savior, my rock, my stone I build my life upon. The rains came, the floodwaters rose. My house was secure. 
Lord Jesus, I build my life upon the rock. With every head bowed, every eye closed, praying with me right now. If you need to invest your life into the rock, Jesus Christ, let me pray for you. Let me know who you are right now. I want to pray for you. Raise your hand. Say, pray for me, Pastor Lucas. I want to invest my life in the rock. I raise my hand to say, pray for me. Go ahead, lift your hand up. Anybody in this place want to invest in eternity? The rock of Jesus Christ. It won't move. His word is strong. I see a hand. Awesome. Very, very good. This is what we'll do, church. Let's worship just a little bit together. And the, the young woman that raised your hand, I want to pray for you down here at the front. I won't embarrass you any further, I promise, but we, let's pray together, okay? Let's all stand on our feet. Let's worship a little bit, church. Can we do that? Let's worship the rock. Come on down. I want to pray for you. Come on down. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out, you are worthy, God. You are worthy, God. Come on, sing it out. Because we crown you. We fall face down and we worship. We all cry out, you are worthy. today. Thanks for coming to church. Glad you're here. Let me just also remind you and encourage you. If you're a guest, fill out that Connect card, turn in guest services. We have free gift for all of our guests today. I'll see you Wednesday night. We got great things happening Wednesday night at church. I'm doing a breakout. Jen's doing a breakout. Pastor Steve is on camera. He's, he's doing a breakout. We got great things happening. We'll see you next week too. All right, church, you're dismissed. Have a great one.